my guest today in the Emerging Markets podcast is Kramar D'Souza. When we are talking about the Brazilian political landscape and specifically about the Brazilian democratic period since 1985, it's important to understand the fact that after the end of the authoritarian regime, the way that the authoritarian regime ended in Brazil was quite different from other countries like Argentina, for example. That's Kramer there. He is a PhD in international relations with a background in history. He has been a professor at the Catholic University of Brasilia, formerly visiting faculty at the University of Florida and a US State Department fellow. In 2018, Kramer launched his own consultancy, Dharma Political Risk and Strategy in Brasilia, Brazil. He is joining me today to dive a little deeper into Brazilian politics. It's like opening an encyclopedia. We talk about political risk, contemporary Brazilian political history, which is one of Kramer's favourite topics, through to the current Bolsonaro administration. He informs us on the failures of the PT, the Workers' Party, which lost power in the 2018 election, and comments on policy reforms underway to drive economic growth and investment in Brazil. This is the second episode of the Brazil series of the Emerging Markets podcast. So my guest today is Kramar de Souza. He's the founder and CEO of Dharma Political Risk and Strategy, based in Brasilia, Brazil. So good morning, Kramar. Good morning, man. It's an enormous pleasure for me being here and discuss a little bit about political risk, strategy, and the landscape of Brazilian political scenario. Great. So uh, let's basically start with um, an introduction. If you could tell us a bit about your background personally and professionally, and uh, a bit about the founding of Dharma and what it's about. Well, Ben, I'm a former historian student. I, my background is based on history. And after that, I studied, I did my master in international relations. And I lived in, in USA. I received a grant from the Department of State to study in their lobby and political risk and decision making process. I came back to Brazil and I work in um, some universities here. For example, the Catholic University of Brasilia. It's a really prestigious university here. And worked also in a Brazilian think tank named IPEA. And about one year and a half ago, I decided to start my own business. And then I founded Dharma, Political Risk and Strategy. And why? Because I perceived during my experience analyzing politics, for Brazilian media and for Brazilian business community that uh, the political environment and the political landscape here create a lot of challenges for for the business community. So I perceived the opportunity and the necessity uh, by the, the entrepreneurs here in Brazil to understand a little bit more about politics, about the decision-making process, to avoid any kind of risk or bad decision made by the politicians who affects directly or indirectly the business and the economy here in Brazil. So I founded Dharma, and nowadays we are working on providing political intelligence, strategy, and perspectives for our clients here in Brazil. Okay, so let's just back up a moment and let's start with what political risk is and what you mean by political intelligence and why it's important for a company or indeed a foreign investor, to have a political risk strategy. And uh, let's sort of focus on Brazil. And then also, how does a political risk strategy tie in with investment due diligence? Specifically in the case of Brazil, Ben, I, I believe political risk, it's an important issue in terms of doing business here in Brazil. And why? First of all, because uh, Brazil, it's not a, a high quality democracy. So sometimes uh, the government in, in any, stage, any stance can do some bad decisions who will affect all the economic environment. For this reason, and I believe the, the Brazilian companies and foreign companies who want to make business in Brazil need the support of a political strategy and intelligence firm. Specifically in our case at Dharma, our team uh, is really engaged and understood and compilates all the information about the Brazilian political environment for our clients in a really didactic way. 
big and why this? Because Brazil is uh, quite complex. We have a lot of political parties. And since 2013, we are experiencing here a really deep polariza political polarization process. When we are talking about politics, specifically in terms of Brazil, the capacity of destruction driven by any government is really, it's really high. So sometimes we must to understood what the government wants to do. And if you have the opportunity, we must talk with the government to avoid any kind of bad decision. And I believe this is our main mission here today. How would you say foreign investors should begin to understand political risk in Brazil? How does that process begin? Well, specifically in the case of Dharma, all this process starts with a uh, first presentation when we show to them the Bra what we, sh we name it by Brazilian political landscape. And showing this Brazilian political landscape, you show to them the, the main names, the main, the main politicians, and the, the most important institutions in the Brazilian decision-making process. And trying to give to them the possibility to understand how the things are doing in Brazil uh, without any kinds of excessive optimistic, but without any kinds of excessive pessimism. What I mean, we are trying to show to them the Brazil, Brazil politics in a quite objective way. And in these terms, it's important to understand two things. The first of all, uh, Brazil, at, since the, the democratization, is the first time in the Brazilian political history that we have a full right government. Bolsonaro and his political groups, they identify themselves as a conservatives, or how we explain this in Brazil, they characterize themselves as a liberal conservatives, what it means. In terms of politics, they are quite conservatives, and in terms of economics, they are trying to impose a really liberal agenda. This kind of double edge in terms of politics and economy provides for foreign investors a good uh, a good environment in terms of investments and because the government is working really hard to attract more foreign investments to Brazil, they are working on privatization, they are working on a lot of important reforms. But on the other hand, the fact that the government is declaring itself as a conservative government and they are trying by uh, electoral pressure to reinvent the way that Brazil doing politics in terms of democracy, Sometimes they have some big difficulties in terms of negotiation with the Brazilian Congress. And in these terms, it's, it's quite important to understand if you want to do business in Brazil now, you must to, to perceive that in one hand, the government has a lot of goodwill in terms of establishing a really liberal and open agenda and put Brazil in, uh, in the global economy in a good way. But in political terms, this government has a lot of difficulties to, to drive this agenda based on the fact they received a electoral uh, imposition in terms of reinventing Brazilian politics and what it means. Mm -hmm. They are pressured by their electoral basis to create a new way of establishing the political circuit here in Brazil. And Specifically in this issue, it's important to understand the fact that Brazil has more than 20 parties represented in the Brazilian Congress. Right. This fact per se uh, creates a lot of pressure in any kind of government because they must to establish a huge and very fragmented political basis in the Congress. And what happened on the next election? The Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro was elected with the promise to reinvent this process. What I mean, uh, Bolsonaro was elected giving his speech and promises for his electorate about the fact that under his government, he will not create any kind of traditional coalition. Mm -hmm. So we are in October, the government started in January, and since then they are suffering a lot to create any kind of agenda in terms of relation, a uh, strong relationship between the executive and the legislative branches here. Right. I do want to come into the idea of uh, the modern strategy of coalition building in Brazilian politics, but I'd just like to take a step back to figure out how we got to where we are now. You say the political landscape and doing business in Brazil now is quite different. Tell us a bit about how we got to where we are now. 
as a historian, I always like this, this kind of long-term process. <laughs> so well, when we are talking about the Brazilian political landscape and specifically about the Brazilian democratic period since 1985, it's important to understand the fact that after the end of the authoritarian regime, the way that the authoritarian regime ended in Brazil was quite different from other countries like Argentina, for example, or Chile. Here, uh, the end of the authoritarian regime was built up by the, a consensus between all the, the political actors. What I mean, the, the military go back to their homes and they gave the opportunity to the civil, civil politicians establish a new kind of, of government. Uh, based on the fact that they just the two two sides just forgot all the mistakes they that they did during the the military process, this kind of general am amnesty who happens in Brazil created the conditions of a new political pact, and this political pact created the our constitution, and specifically about the the Brazilian constitution, the constitution was marked by the huge effort and challenge to to achieve a more equal and free society here in brazil okay and for this reason we experienced here a succession of uh, center and center from the left governments from fernando henrique cardoso to lula and dilma we experienced mm -hmm. that kind of uh, tropical social democracy here and the failure of this this government, specifically the failure of Dilma's administration to keep the changes and the guarantees in social equality in one hand and to create a good economical environment in the other hand, driving the Brazilian electorate and the Brazilian perception, the Brazilian citizenship perception about the politics, about the necessity to change everything. And specifically about Bolsonaro's victory, I believe he the victory was marked by a sense of orphanage between the, the Brazilian ordinary people who stopped to identify themselves with the traditional leadership represented by the Partido dos Trabalhadores, the Workers' Party here, or parties like PSDB, and they just just decided to give a, a chance for, for new incumbents, and they, they, see, they saw Bolsonaro as a kind of renovation inside a really fragmented and corrupt political system here. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the uh, PSDB there, who was obviously in power prior to the Workers' Party, uh, prior to Lula da Silva in 2002. In the most recent election, they were completely decimated yeah. okay. in 2018. What do you see was the cause behind that? I believe the, the, main, the main issue... Uh, the key point in terms of the decimation of PSDB as a political option in Brazil is linked with the fact that they did a lot of bad choices in terms of political behavior during the, the last decade. First of all, they, they suffered a lot in terms of embrace to themselves the legacy of Fernando Henrique Cardoso presidency mm -hmm. in such ways uh, the party was never engaged in the defense of the Fernando Henrique Cardoso's legacy, who was quite important because the political, institutional, and economical reforms made by Fernando Henrique Cardoso drive Brazil during the, the PT years to a really, really good economic status. And the end of the capacity of these reforms to drive in the, a good economical behavior were a good, are a good explanation to understand the failure of Dilma's Rousseff government because she refused to do any kind of new reform and Brazil needed the reforms in, in 2012. Uh, the, the Brazilian economy, economy needed a lot of reform. And in terms of political attitude, since the end of the, the Fernando Henrique's presidency, uh, the leaderships on, of PSDB are not engaged in the defense of this legacy in one hand, and they were not engaged in unify the party to build up a new kind of strategy and narrative. What I mean, the three main actors uh, in PSDB in the, during the, the PT era, José Serra, Geraldo Alckmin, and Aécio Neves, was never, they were never engaged in 
in the building up of a new kind of party. And they, they really believe that the, the PSDB was the only option against the PT. Right. And they failed really, really deeply in building up a kind of alternative narrative and alternative strategy for Brazil. And this was really good for the PT and was terrible for PSDB. Because when Bolsonaro born as a political option, they were decimated, as you said before, in the last electoral race in Brazil. So then let's uh, talk about the Workers' Party era, firstly under Lula da Silva and secondly under Dilma Rousseff. Obviously, in the first part of Lula da Silva's uh, reign, Brazil saw some impressive economic growth, upward GDP growth. But again, Lula da Silva was also known for uh, some nefarious activity in terms of his coalition building. There were some bribes that were going on um, between the Workers' Party and, and other minority parties to gain, a, a, to build that coalition. But what do you think underpinned the growth of Brazil? And, and do you look upon those years, historically, do you look upon those years as positive for Brazil or, or otherwise? Wow. <laughs> I believe the, the, the PT era and the, specifically about the Lula years, First of all, it's important to understand the fact that during this trajectory who put Lula's on the Brazilian presidency, the Workers' Party, differently from the PSDB, was really efficient and understood what the Brazilian elect, what Brazilian citizenship and the electors are looking for. And for this reason, Lula and his team, uh, well, they, they were really efficient in terms of building up a narrative who guaranteeing that moment for the Brazilian electoral electors that that PT will keep all the economic gains who are made under Fernando Henrique Cardoso administration and they will provide something new. And what is about this new? Uh, a lot of social gains, a lot of social preoccupations in terms of developing good public policies for fighting inequality in Brazil. And they also promised that they will be less corrupt than Fernando Henrique's administration. And corruption is a key issue in terms of understanding the relationship between the Brazilian citizenship and the politicians. Right. Uh, every single president since Lula always promised for Brazilian electors that they will be less corrupt than the prior president. Okay. <laughs> and, and for this reason, I believe the end of... PT era was really engaged with the with this process of disillusionment, disillusionment uh, made it by, feel it by Brazilian society in terms of, okay, they promised they will be less corrupt and now they are also corrupt. So uh, they did it created the conditions who, for this turning point in terms of Brazilian political landscape and environment. So then. Given that, and I've heard this from other commentators as well, that corruption is kind of endemic and inbuilt into Brazilian politics. But given this, what you've just been speaking about, then where does that, where do you believe that stems from? Where, where does that come from? In terms of understanding the corruption, the, the role of corruption in the Brazilian political system, I believe it's important to understand the fact that. Corruption is not an exclusive issue in this moment of Brazilian society. The key point in my, in my perspective is the fact that, given the fact that now we are a democracy here, people started to talk about the corruption and people started to blame about the corruption. And specifically, they used the internet and the social networks based on internet to blame a lot about corruption. And this kind of transformation about the, the citizenship behavior in terms in front of corruption and other kinds of bribery scandals was occurred without any kinds of interpretation about the politicians uh, in terms of, okay, the political landscape is changing and we are not ready to understand this new kind of moment and this new kind of process. And specifically in terms of the PT, they were less ready than other parties for, for understood this new moment because they created themselves in a strong political narrative that 
uh, based on the fact that PT is less corrupt than the other parties, or PT is never it was not corrupted. The others, the other parties are corrupt, not the PT. And these kinds of collective deny of the the main leaderships of the party created a lot of good conditions in terms of electoral electoral perspective for other groups creates a new kind of narrative putting the PT on the corner and specifically Bolsonaro was the most prepared political entity political actor in Brazil to give it so I'd like to, to ask you about uh, Dilma Rousseff. Uh, she's quite a polarizing figure in Brazilian politics. And of course, she was the first female president in Brazil and one of the very few female leaders around the world. In your estimation, what is the significance of Dilma Rousseff, uh, firstly, as a leader, uh, head of the political party? Wow. <laughs> uh, Dilma was elected as a kind of continuation uh, about the Lula's legacy. Right. And the Brazilian Brazilian citizenship, the Brazilian electors and the Brazilian political system really believed in the fact that Lula, that Dilma as Lula, as Lula da Silva, will be able to establish a good political environment and create the conditions to establish the, the country in political, in, uh, a great political dialogue in terms of political environment. But... Uh, it's important to understand, and we understood that in a really hard way, that Dilma wasn't Lula. And the difference between the way to understood the politics and the way to understood the political narrative, and mainly the way to understood the political day-by-day -day action driven by Dilma, put Brazil in a really hard situation because, differently from the prior president, she was much more engaged in a kind of political a open political confrontation mm -hmm. because Lula, besides the fact that he was an uh, unexperienced president be before the, his presidency, Lula was always really worried about the possibility to establish bridges between the government and the opposition. And he worked hard to establish this kind of bridges. In the other hand, Dilma was never worried about establishing any kind of political bridge or political dialogue with the opposition. And as a result, not just the opposition, but sometimes members of the governmental coalition under Dilma's Rousseff presidency feel themselves a part of the decision-making process. And this is quite important to understand how the Brazilian political coalition system works, because it's impossible here establish a government based in one or two parties. We will need five, ten parties in the Congress to to drive a government in a proper way. And for these, we must to share parts of the government with these, with your partners. And in such ways, this way of, the, the Dilma's Rousseff way of government was not good in sharing pieces of the government with their, their partners. And this erosion of dialogue, first of all, inside the governmental base in the executive and also in the legislative, and after that, this erosion of dialogue between the government and the opposition created a really hard situation for Dilma Rousseff, who became worse and worse after the fact that a lot of scandals erupted involving members of the, the Workers' Party. And in this moment, I believe people inside and outside of the political system are inside or outside of the political decision-making circuit, perceived Dilma as a no essential figure, or they perceived Dilma as a not part of the of the solution, but, but just part of the problem. And for this reason, he suffered a really hard process of impeachment and was terrible for the country in institutional terms, And but was an indicator in my point of view that Dilma was never perceived of, as a part of the, the solution or as a part of any kind of political arrangement who will stabilize the Brazilian political environment in that moment. Right. So one of the things you touch on there is the, the idea of, of coalition building, right? Mm -hmm. So 
I mean, it, it's something I understand that is a, a strategy in, in Brazilian politics because of the diversification uh, and the enormous number of political parties in Brazil. And I want to know, is that something that is unique in the Brazilian political landscape? Is that unique in the world? And has this idea, and I think you sort of touched on this earlier, has this altered course under the current administration? Well, Ben, talking about the, the, the building of, of, of huge political coalitions, I believe other countries have uh, suffered also this problem of a uh, multipolarized partisan system. But specifically in case of Brazil, since the middle of Lula's government, the number of parties uh, er rose and rose and rose. And why? Because the, the traditional political leaderships here perceived that any government will need political support in the Congress. And why they, they decided to do, okay, I will create a new party to have a, a bigger piece of the government. So the fragmentation of Brazilian political and party direct system, it's a terrible problem. And they put any, any kind of government on the corner in terms that they need to establish a good relationship with the legislative. And to establish this good relationship with the legislative, they must give pieces of the government for their coalition supporters. And this process, in, in my perception, was really traumatic in terms of Dilma's government and now so have in the short period of Temer's government and the negative perceptions of the society about this, this specific politi political issue drive it. Uh, the Brazilian electors for voting for a political group who promised to them they will not establish this kind of traditional coalition. And this is the great advantage of Bolsonaro government because he keep it the promise, but is also the huge problem of Bolsonaro's strategy in terms of advancing for any kind of political and institutional reform here. Because without a political basis uh, or without a strong political base, the government is not efficient enough in terms of negotiation to advance a lot of important agendas in Brazilian Congress. Now, that's a very interesting point there, and because this ties into the, you know, the, the future governing capability of this administration. So can you explain a bit more about that situation? Well, in terms of the, the Bolsonaro's administration, they established a strategy uh, to avoid any kinds of strong partnership or strong coalition building between the government and any kind of political parties inside the Congress. Specifically, they establish a single negotiation for every single issue they need to vote in the Congress. This is good in terms of preserving the government in front of his electors to keep in the narrative about the fact that the government is not parting up part of any kind of unfair negotiation for pieces of the government. But on the other hand, in terms of real politics and day-by-day decision-making process, it's terrible for the government. And why? Because they need to establish a new kind of strategy for any kind of issue or subject they, that the government perceive as important in terms of relationship with the Congress. So, and, and, and for explaining it better, I must to, to go back for the beginning of our conversation here. Uh, remember, I told the government is a mix of political conservative and liberal in terms of economics. Mm -hmm. And any kind of agenda or issue who are perceived as important by the Congress and mainly the, the economic issues are really important for the Congress in that moment because the, the congressmen, the congresswoman are really under pressure based on the fact that we have some problems in economic terms here. Uh, the government will be uh, well succeed to approve important reforms. As, as an example, the pensions reform were really close to be approved by the Senate, Senate, Brazilian Senate on the second round. And Bolsonaro will give to Brazilian society the, the most important pensions reform in the last 50 years of Brazilian history. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the political issues who are considered really important for, go for the government 
and these issues are really linked in a, with a conservative agenda, the government will suffer a lot to, to approve them. And why? Because without any kind of really strong coalition basis, uh, the government is not, is not strong enough to impose any kind of agenda for Brazilian Congress. And specifically, it's important to understand that President Bolsonaro is less, uh, he suffers with a lack of capacity in terms of creating bridges in terms of political landscape. In such ways, Bolsonaro is, is closer than Dilma, from, uh, than Dilma is closer uh, to, to Lula, for example. Right, okay. What I mean, uh, Bolsonaro is much more uh, forged by the idea that confrontation is good. And Lula and Fernando Henrique, for example, are much more comfortable with the idea that uh, composition and dialogue is better than confrontation. And imagine the situation. If the president is not comfortable to establish good, uh, in establish a good negotiation process with the other parties or also the opposition, this president will suffer a lot to approve or impose any kinds of agenda or project in terms of the day by day of the Congress activities here in Brazil. Because we must understand the fact that it's impossible a single party agenda to prosper here. We have more than 20 parties represented in Brazilian Congress. So every single vote counts. And in this perspective, it's quite important for the president to understand the fact that he must to start to establish good bridges. But what is the challenge here? If the president establishes any kind of bridge with the opposition or other political groups, the president will lose the electoral support who put him in the presidency. So the presidents are in the middle of a trick situation. And this trick situation probably will prolong themselves until the end of this government. Right. There's a lot to unpack in that in that whole statement. And there are a couple of things I want to speak about with respect to PSL, uh, Bolsonaro's party. But just before we get on to that, when you talk about um, Bolsonaro's nature of confrontation and this lack of bridge building, that suggests to me that the governing capability going forward for this administration is going to be very limited and stagnant. Would, would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, specifically, the political movement made by the Brazilian business community is driving in the, in the direction of Rodrigo, Rodrigo Maia, who is the president of the House, and also in the direction of Davi Alcolumbre, who is the president of Brazilian Senate. And why? Because they perceived the goodwill emanated by Rodrigo Maia and Alcolumbre in terms of developing good legislative approaches and strategies to advance any kind of economic and important economic and institutional reforms. What I mean, uh, in such ways, this political perspective created by Bolsonaro, who feels himself, himself much more comfortable in terms of confrontation than in dialogue, created a, a space of opportunity for the president of the House and for the president of the Brazilian Senate to create a new channel of dialogue between them and the Brazilian society. And a lot of people here look to Rodrigo Maia and also to Davi Alcolumbre as the solution of any risk or any political risk in terms of advancing good agendas in economic terms. Okay. Let's look at uh, Bolsonaro's party, the PSL. Now, he only joined this party very recently, when he, uh, just prior to his run for the presidency, uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct. And I believe he's also shifted the, ide the ideology of this party significantly in his own shadow as well. So can you perhaps provide us an overview of the PSL as it is today? What does the PSL stand for? And, and what really is the Bolsonaro government trying to achieve in, in terms of business in Brazil? Well, Ben, it's an it's amazing question. I believe it, this is the one, $1 million question. <laughs> what drives PSL? <laughs> well, it, it's important to understand the fact that before Bolsonaro's, before Bolsonaro's affiliation to the party, PSL was a really small party in Brazilian political landscape. And they, they had at, at least 80 deputies in the House. And they are 
near to insignificancy in terms of Brazilian political landscape. They, are, they were not one of the main parties and they are not recognized as an ideological party. In the contrary, they are recognized as a kind of physiological party and sometimes some politi political figures go to, to PSL to guarantee to themselves a, a, a small piece of, the, of any, any government in any kind of situation. Uh, what changed? The Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro was a huge electoral phenomenon. And Bolsonaro elected uh, more than 50 deputies for PSL. And after this, we have a, a huge problem because in such ways, remember, I told to you that President Bolsonaro didn't feel comfortable establishing breeds. And these breeds can be interpreted uh, with, uh, by the perception about, okay, he's not comfortable to establish in breeds with the opposition. It's, it's okay. But the question is, Bolsonaro is not as good to establishing a bridging building process with his own party. What it means, the PSL suffers with a huge lack of agenda and orientation. And this is marked by the fact that in this exactly moment, President Bolsonaro is in, is in an open confrontation with the PSL president, Luciano Bivar. And what it means for the future, probably we will see on the next months a process of fragmentation in the PSL. And this fragmentation will put the Brazilian conservative movement under a, a threat because they must choose if they are they must choose if the, the Brazilian right wing is a Bolsonarist movement or if they are a right movement. And this lack of, of cohesion inside the PSL probably will drive the president, his more close political group, to another party. And uh, Mr. Bivar will receive the challenge to rebuild up the PSL and make PSL strong for the next year elections. Because every two years we have a kind of election here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the second year of the, the presidential mandate, we face here the municipal elections, who are a kind of uh, pre-presidential election race. What I mean, the election of mayors and the distribution of power between parties across the country can guarantee less are more space in the presidential election election two years ahead. So I want to focus really on what is being done in terms of uh, policy toward business, investment and trade. Um, these are the important things that we want to talk about for the people that we talk with. So all the other sort of politics aside, what actually is the Bolsonaro administration putting on the table in terms of policy to stimulate growth and investment in Brazil? Well, good. To the point, uh, the government achieved the pensions reform in the first year of the administration. This is quite good, uh, considering the fact that the Congress is really fragmented here. And probably the president will sign the pension reform until the end of this year. In the other hand, Ministro Paulo Guedes is driving a really, a really strong uh, process of uh, the re regulation of Brazilian economy, and also it's quite important. And the government is trying to establish a lot of good policies in terms of digital platform. Mm -hmm. And the third issue, who I consider, I consider is really, I consider really important, is a, a tax reform. The government is working hard, and yesterday, Minister Guedes created a special group to begin the studies about the tax reform. And if the govern Bolsonaro's government was efficient in terms to, to give to Brazilian society a complete pensions reform and also a taxes reform, Brazilian economy will put on in a good way to start a, a strong period of growth. And probably this will allow Bolsonaro to run in a good position for re-election. So one of the key 
trade relationships, probably the key trade relationship that Brazil has is with China. Uh, and it's one that has been growing significantly in, in certainly in very recent years. Almost half of Brazil's crude oil exports go to China. A large part of their agricultural produce uh, goes to China from soybeans and, and beef and so on. So could you speak to the, the nature and the significance of the Brazil-China relationship and how might this play out during the Bolsonaro administration, given that on the campaign trail, he was quite critical of Chinese investments into Brazil and he has, a, you know, this, this fondness for President Trump, who, of course, is engaged in this trade war with, with Beijing. So can you speak a little bit about the Brazil-China relationship? Well, good. Uh, Ben, I believe uh, the main challenge for any kind of political ideology or narrative is the reality. And specifically when we are talking about the relationship between Brazil and China under Bolsonaro's administration, we must understand the the fact that if during the campaign the president was really critical uh, about Chinese investment in Brazil, when he started to administrate the country, he perceived the importance of Chinese investment in terms of survival of Brazilian economy. And for this reason, and based on the fact that the vice president did a really important uh, role, executed a really important role, establishing a good approximation between Brazil and China, Mm. President Bolsonaro now is convinced about the importance of Chinese investments here. And probably you will see the are growing of Chinese investments here because it's a, another important issue in terms of economics. But the, this government established a new uh, regulamentation for telecom here in Brazil. And probably a huge Chinese company as China Mobile will be part in the Brazilian tele, telecommunications market in the near future. And why? Because the, this government perceived the necessity to establish a huge number of international partnerships in a way to establish a in a way to pavement a economic growth for the the Brazilian economic economical system, and for this reason specifically, I believe besides the fact that Bolsonaro has a personal uh, encampment about President Trump, he are, he's not in avoiding any kind of approximation or dialogue between Brazil and China in in terms of economic growth. Right. And you touched on their uh, vice president, Hamilton Mural, who is obviously been very critical in this relationship with China as well. Can you speak a moment about his influence? Well, President Mural uh, changed his, uh, his way of doing politics since the beginning of the government. In the months of January, February, March, for example, Mural Speak, speak openly about any kinds of personal critics about the Bolsonaro's government. And since May and June, Bos- B- Moron become a little bit more discreet. What it means, he works more in, in the backstage of the government, trying to orient some decision-making process and giving support for the president in terms of open the president's mind about some point of views. Uh, specifically, Moron is doing a great, did a great job convincing the president to go to China and talk directly with the Chinese administration about economic cooperation. In the other hand, the vice president is also important, giving some support for this presidency with the, the military ranks in Brazil. So there are a couple of just a couple of last questions I'd like to go over with you, and let's finish on a on a light note. Maybe you could perhaps advise us on what are the three key issues, from your perspective, you think that foreign investors should be aware of coming into Brazil. I believe the the three important issues for any foreign investor to put his foot in Brazil. First of all, the foreign investors must understood the fact that. In Brazil, sometimes the things not happen in a really fast way. What I mean, we are a huge country with a lot of political perspectives about everything. So sometimes the government is not so fast in terms to 
driving for business community and for foreign investors what they want to give them to them. The second issue, the second advice, it's always important to wait until the moment where the regulation is really clear to put your feet on, on the beach. What I mean, for example, in terms of the, the, the new regulament, regulation of telecom here, we waited for about four years to establish a new regulation for telecom services here in Brazil. And now the president signed the bill, but probably we must wait until we must wait for one more year to, to finish the whole process. So sometimes we must to understood that the, the fact that uh, the, the things are not so, so clear or so fast in Brazil. The third one is quite important to receive the proper advice for proper people here about the political landscape and about any kind of political risk. Specifically, every time when me and my team at Dharma, we are talking with any kind of foreign clients, we try to explain to them how important it is to be really precise in terms of what are you talking about, what you want about the government, and about the capacity of the government to give what you want. Because sometimes, and specifically about this government, uh, based on the fact they suffer a lack of a legislative strategy, they are not so able to give for the business community or for any kind of foreign investors a good uh, regulation, regulation landscape here. So let me ask you this then, in a way of wrapping this up and closing out. Tell me a bit about Brazil. Tell me why foreign investors and people should come and visit Brazil and perhaps invest and do business in Brazil. Wow. Uh, I, believe it, I believe a foreign investor must come to Brazil because we, have, uh, we are a huge country with a lot of consumers and we have a lot of potential in terms of the regulation, privatization, and new opportunities of doing business here. Uh, Brasilia, Brazil specifically, besides the fact of any kind of difficult situation in political terms, Brazil is a democracy. Brazil is working hard in terms of becoming a free market economy. And this kind of opportunity gives for any kind of foreign investor a huge opportunity to make a lot of good negotiations and a lot of good business here. The countries in the Brazilian society is really engaged to transform the country in a free market country, less corrupt, much more engaged in any kinds of globalization movement. And I believe these aspects and circumstances make Brazil a good choice in terms of foreign investment. Well, thanks to my guest today, Kramer de Souza the founder and CEO of Dharma Political Risk and Strategy. You can find a link in the show notes. And thanks for tuning in. If you've enjoyed the show or want to reach out with any other comment, our email address is also in the show notes. The Emerging Markets Podcast is produced by Peacock Advisory Group. 